listen only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm very excited about this webinar. Dr. Alan Bauman, um, as you know, will be presenting what he knows and, and what he is able to share with us in a, in a short webinar. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Bauman, he is a full-time board certified hair transplant surgeon who's treated over 17,000 patients. And he's actually performed over 7,000 hair transplant procedures since starting his Bauman Medical Hair Loss Practice in Boca, uh, which he started in 1997. He's the founder and medical director at Bauman Medical. He's been featured in the world's leading media as a medical expert and successful early adopter of some of the most advanced technologies in the treatment of hair loss. I'm, I'm sure he'll tell you about some of those, including, of course, platelet-rich plasma, my passion, and low-level laser light therapy, as well as FUE hair transplantation using both neograft and Artis robotic hair transplant systems, and the CRLAB CNC 3D printed hair and scalp prosthetic from Italy. I can't wait to hear about that. He received his MD degree from New York Medical College. He completed his surgical residency training at Mount Sinai Medical Center and Beth Israel Medical Center in New York. He's only one of a hundred physicians worldwide to achieve board certification from the esteemed American and International Board of Hair Restoration Surgery. He really does know what he's talking about. He's a fellow of the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery. He's actively uh, participates in lectures at numerous annual scientific meetings and live surgery workshops. He's the author of several textbook chapters on the science of hair care and hair transplantation. He also does eyelash transplantation surgery. So a lot to learn here tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone over to him. Of course, there will be a question and answer section at the end of the webinar. And also, I just wanted to mention that we record all of these webinars. We are posting them at the join.studioprp.com website under the webinar tab. You can see the ones that we've done previously. And we will also send out a link to the recording if you have to drop out early or I'm imagining that you're going to want to watch it more than a couple of times. So you're on, Dr. Bauman. Thanks again for joining us. Great. Well, hey, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Roy. Really, I, I appreciate the invitation to collaborate with you on this, uh, on this project. I'm excited to be able to share what we've learned over the past uh, number of years, uh, really since 2008 in the field of hair restoration and doing PRP. And uh, it's just exciting to be here with you guys, and uh, I hope that you find it useful, useful, uh, interesting, and uh, maybe it's something that you want to add or enhance in your practice if you're already doing PRP. So uh, as we get started here, uh, this hopefully you all can see the uh, advancing of the slides. This is just a, a some legal mumbo jumbo that basically says that if you're really interested in using some of the information that I've presented here that you should probably ask me and uh, before you do screen captures and incorporate this into any other presentation. Just uh, would appreciate that. I had unfortunately some issues this year with uh, uh, colleagues who were using a lot of our photos without my permission. So of course, I'm, I'm sure all of you watching and, and doing this uh, uh, webinar with us tonight wouldn't do that. So just please ask if you want it. We're, we're happy to share all this information as long as it's properly attributed. And we, we certainly collaborate uh, with other physicians and other uh, people from all over the world, other scientists, to, to learn about what we do, and we're happy to share it. But you shouldn't pass other stuff off as, as your own. Um, so as uh, Dr. Roy mentioned, I'm the founder and medical director of Bauman Medical Group, located in Boca Raton since 1997. It's been my life's work and my life's passion to treat patients with hair loss. Uh, if you're in town in South Florida, you should stop by our 11,000 square foot facility. And our mission always is to improve the appearance and well-being of our patients through optimum hair health and restoration, of course. And there are many different uh, aspects of the practice, which I can uh, explain at a later date, but basically it encompasses medical research. We also have a consulting division, a trichology division, and of course what you're participating in tonight is part of our educational arm. So tonight uh, we'll go through a little bit uh, about who I am and uh, just elaborate a little bit on uh, my background and, and bio, uh, go into hair loss and hair restoration, really the problems that exist out there, We'll talk a quick bit about hair follicle physiology, go into PRP basic science, and how we use PRP in hair restoration today, 
day in and day out, really in our uh, in our practice, and talk just quickly about some practical considerations and give you some ideas on how you can expand your knowledge in PRP and hair loss. Uh, it's certainly an exciting time in the in the field of, of hair loss, and uh, especially with the advent of PRP. There's so much more data now, so much more information than we had just a few years ago in the clinical literature. So it's exciting to bring some of that stuff to you. Dr. Roy mentioned uh, my training and my accolades. Obviously, you can, you can reference that later on if you'd like. She also mentioned that we do treat about 1,000 patients per year. And through our hair loss protocols, we try to diagnose and medically treat these patients. We track the hair loss and their hair regrowth scientifically through measurement tools that were actually not even available when I started my training 20 years ago. And a lot of what we do in the practice is not just hair transplantation, but it's this medical management and the compliance protocols. So we'll touch on that at the end of the PRP lecture today. And of course, our commitment to education. So what's the story with hair? Uh, why is it so important to us? I guess evolutionarily, um, hair was designed to make us look good and feel good. That's what it, that's what it means to look in the mirror and, and have a youthful and healthy head of hair. And in society today, uh, most people want this beauty and youth and uh, vision of health. And a good, healthy head of hair exemplifies all of those things. And when, But when hair loss occurs, um, some other things can ha happen. So here's a, a, a very busy slide, so I apologize for that. It's actually a um, like an infogram that tells you a little bit about the hair loss statistics. And it's staggering that there are maybe nearly almost 100 million Americans out there who are suffering from hair loss. So 40 million men, about four and seven, are going to get it, and about women are going to have some thinning hair. And it could mean, uh, you know, a bad hair day could turn into a bad hair life if, uh, if hair loss is occurring. And certainly we should not underestimate a psychosocial impact of hereditary hair loss. Um, these are things that have been well studied and well documented in the literature. Shame, anger, embarrassment and such, uh, sadness and depression, frustration by those who are experiencing hair loss is not uncommon. And it's something that we see every single day in the office. I'll tell you, you know, uh, probably not a day goes by here at Bauman Medical where we don't have a male or, a, or female patient come in who is in significant distress about their hair loss situation. So it really requires a lot of compassion. Uh, you know, sometimes when we're dealing, especially female hair loss, uh, you know, the, the patient's crying, we're crying, my nurses are crying, everybody, everybody's crying, but we're getting through it and, uh, and we're getting to the, to the meat of the matter and we're treating the situation. And on the other end, obviously, there's, there's smiles and happiness. But when hair loss occurs, uh, it can be a bad situation. And we do see hair loss in many different patient populations. I treat uh, even toddlers who have had injuries, uh, who have hair loss from scarring or, or, uh, or surgeries, and then uh, teenagers who are terribly uh, you know, overstyling their hair, and of course the other alopecias that we see commonly, as well as androgenetic alopecia, which makes up the bulk of the practice. But we also treat alopecia areata and totalis and offered some uh, options for them as well. So as we get into in my favorite organ, obviously the hair follicle. It's a pretty amazing little bit of business there, sitting under your skin. And uh, you know, I would call it uh, a very, very highly accessible dermal appendage, which is muscular, neurovascular, endocrine, mini organ that contains a stem cell niche capable of degeneration, regeneration, and obviously can generate a pretty significant emotional response if things are going in a good way, or uh, unfortunately if there's hair loss, maybe in a bad way. But there's about 100 to 150,000 of these follicles on your scalp. Um, about nine out of ten of them are producing hair at any given time, and they're producing at a rate of a, about a half an inch a month. So that's about 1,600 inches a day total over the course over the top of a healthy head of scalp. And uh, so that's that's a uh, that's that's 138 feet of hair per day there. Uh, I'm sorry, 1,600 inches per day and 138 feet of hair just from your scalp alone. And that doesn't take into account the five million body hair follicles that you have. As we move along, uh, there are a lot of research that has been done on the neurovascular part of the hair follicle, and today, of course, even the stem cell uh, areas in, within the hair follicle itself. To the lower left here, you see the, the vasculature that surrounds the bottom of the follicle. So anything that impacts blood flow is going to be very, very helpful to us. And uh, on the upper right, you see the multi multicolored uh, image there that, that uh, is highlighting not only the, the, uh, the bulge, which is the stem cell location within the hair follicle, but also the neurovascular bundles that are in that, in that, also in that zone. Uh, it's important to know that hair follicles cycle on and cycle off. As I mentioned, nine out of 10 are in a growing phase. The others are in a resting phase. And so we've all heard of antigen, catagen, and telogen, uh, the parts of the hair cycle. Um, the hairs are ejected from the scalp. 
uh, somewhere between uh, telogen and antigen, of course, as the new hair is produced, it can push out the old one. Uh, but problems with antigen and catagen and telogen can result in significant shedding. Um, and also, even treatments that stimulate antigen can also uh, exacerbate a shedding condition in the short term. So this is a very important thing to know, and a lot of patients do come in with their little Ziploc baggie of the hair that's fallen out, and uh, of course that's always a, a major concern. Uh, the orchestration of the hair follicle cycling is a, a, a unique process that happens communication between the bulge, the stem cell area within the bulge, which is just below the erector pili muscle there near the sebaceous gland, and the dermal papilla, which is really the, uh, the proliferating area of the of the hair follicle that, that really makes the hair fiber. So there's a lot of communication, uh, intricate communication between these two areas as the, um, as the hair follicle cycles on and cycles off through uh, antigen, catagen, and telogen. And to even get more complicated, uh, many scientists are looking at the entire stem cell nature of the, of the hair follicle, which talks about the interactions between the local uh, cells, not just the follicle, but this would include also uh, uh, cells within the dermis, the dermal fibroblasts have a role in in regulating these on and off cycles, as well as the adipocytes. And uh, I think this will be very important in understanding maybe potentially how PRP really works to stimulate hair growth in the scalp and, uh, and maybe some future treatments as well. So I know this is a busy slide. It's not uh, designed to be an eye test, but I wanted to just give you an idea of some of the growth factors that have already been um, identified in the hair follicle as regulating some of these uh, on and off cycling issues uh, within the stem cell areas and the communication that goes on. You just pay particular attention to a few of them like VEGF and EGF, <coughs> pardon me, uh, interleukin and uh, uh, other cytokines and such. You're going to hear and see these again and again in the literature and, uh, and I don't want to steal some of the thunder but these are also some of the growth factors that we'll find in our platelet-rich plasma and in the, in the alpha granules in the, in the platelets. So when female pattern hair loss occurs, actually it kind of sneaks up on women. Um, you know, this standard ludwig savin scale that you see in every hair textbook, and it goes from one to three. But unfortunately, by the time hair loss is visible to the naked eye and you get to stage two, you've already lost 50% of your hair. So this is really not a great diagnostic tool, unfortunately. Um, but the good news is that we have the abilities to do some measurements and evaluations before we get to the end of stage one here, uh, where it still looks like you have coverage. So a number of different factors can affect hair loss in women, medications, illness, uh, or their overall health and diet, uh, stress levels, cortisol levels can affect the hair follicles as well as hormones and surgery. Certainly heredity is the main factor. Um, but even things like uh, jet lag and sleep-wake cycle disorders, um, not even night float in nurses and such can cause some pretty severe disruption of these uh, cyclical organs that we see on the scalp. And so when hair loss occurs in, in women, it's it's not typical baldness um, if it's a, a hereditary issue. We see a widening part line, a little bit of loss of coverage. It may or may not recede the temple areas, but certainly result in a loss of volume and some certainly some excessive shedding. Now in men, the hair loss is visible from across the room. Um, we can see that it starts with a receding hairline and a balding spot in the crown and sometimes progresses to total hair loss over the course of the scalp. The idea is to try to target the process when you have uh, some hair follicles left in that zone before it's totally dead and gone. Obviously, if the follicles are dead and gone, we have to transplant. So we want to take action early. <coughs> Pardon me. We know that male pattern hair loss is a result of a breakdown product of testosterone into DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which is the main trigger for the miniaturization that occurs in the hair follicle. And so in the scalp of, a, of someone, you have a progressively smaller, thinner, and less pigmented hair that's growing from those follicles over time. They're going to spend more time resting, not as much time growing. Um, and, uh, you know, in our office, we call this follicular homicide. Now, in the lower right-hand corner here, um, I just found a, a picture of my dad back when, uh, when I was a boy, and he's on the right, obviously, there. Um, he had some thinning hair back in 1976, and by, you know, a couple decades later, he had lost all his hair. So it is a progressive condition, obviously we can see that just within the span of 20 years. Uh, he lost all of his hair. Um, and actually, the other reason I put him in the, in the slideshows, because it's one of the reasons why I got into the field of, of hair loss and hair restoration. And uh, I did restore a full head of hair for my dad, and if you've been to the website, you've probably seen that. As we move along, uh, looking at the scalp under the microscope is something that we do every day for every patient. 
in multiple areas, comparing the good areas under high magnification to the areas that are experiencing some thinning. And this is a good example of what we do with the hair cam. It's an iPhone appendage that we use daily. And you see on the left, good quality hair follicles growing good quality hair fibers. And uh, those fibers are thick and they're dark and, uh, and there's a high density of them there. And you can see at the lower magnification, it's producing quite a bit of coverage there. And as we go to the right, there's miniaturizing hairs. And what that means is that you're seeing that thinner, weaker, wispier hair. And uh, obviously resulting in probably a big lack of coverage in this particular patient. I put up this one in particular because I like to show the patient that there, if there are some hair follicles there that we can maybe rescue and enhance with medical therapies. And we do use PRP as a part of a multi-therapy approach in many cases, as well as a standalone treatment as well. But uh, if you can target those follicles before they're really dead and gone, then that's when you're really going to have a chance to make a nice improvement for the patient. So this is going to help you with patient selection and also help you kind of determine before you address an area with PRP, which area is likely to have the best result. And you want to look for that highly miniaturized area where there's still some hair left and it's not totally dead and gone. So what are the treatment strategies here for, that we use in the practice? Um, we want to reduce medical factors for sure. Of course, we're taking a holistic approach. So if there's medical conditions that are causing the situation, medications like uh, blood pressure pills, cholesterol medications, mood modulators, those are terrible. Uh, stress levels, and of course the scalp health is a critical step now. We want to reduce any kind of inflammation of the scalp to try to grow good hair. As I mentioned, the androgens are a big factor in men. It's a tr primary trigger in men. And some women actually are androgen sensitive. And we have ways to figure that out with genetic testing these days. Um, so there's pharmaceutical ways that we can reduce those androgen effects and nutraceutical ways. We want to definitely try to stimulate or enhance those functioning of the, functioning of the follicles. And so this is where we can use the pharmaceutical therapies like topical medications uh, and nutraceuticals as well as cell therapy like PRP and of course low-level laser therapy. I'm a big advocate of light therapy for the scalp. And uh, so in the, actually, and of course hair transplantation. So um, actually two patients on the right hand side on the top, uh, both were treated non-invasively. Top patient uh, used a combination of topicals and laser. Middle, the second patient just laser therapy. Bottom two uh, were hair transplants. Getting into our business tonight of asthma, um, really uh, in, in the old days, we'll say like yeah, 2008, it was old days for the hair doctors, you know, already orthopedic surgeons have been doing PRP for maybe the better part of 10 years and dentists as well. So the hair doctors are kind of late to the game on this, on this program, but, um, but we're trying to play catch up really quick. Um, what we saw is that there were a lot of, uh, uh, and today there's a lot of fields of medicine that can benefit from PRP, everybody from cos uh, cosmetic surgery, to urology and sexual medicine, dermatology, of course, and PRP is great for wound healing. And that's really one of the things that got, that got us started in, the, uh, in using PRP was some of the uh, word on the street from our, from our fellow physicians in hair transplants that they were getting better growth and faster healing from using PRP along with uh, their hair transplants. And uh, it was Dr. Cooley and, and a few others, uh, Dr. Weeble, uh, you know, in South America and, and many others uh, who really kind of pushed it forward and, and got me thinking about it in the very, in the early stages, you know, in the late 2000s. Um, put in a nice picture here, you've got uh, your formed blood components, uh, the red blood cell, obviously easy to identify, white blood cell and a platelet and their relative sizes. And of course, they, they weigh differently and that's why when you centrifuge them or even just stand a test tube in the fridge overnight, it'll settle out and you'll get a separation of them based on their size, thanks to gravity. Um, Platelets, uh, you know, if you're just tuning in, are not just for clotting anymore, actually. Uh, they actually regulate quite a bit of tissue repair and regeneration. And so uh, we can see here that platelets start out kind of in a circular discoid uh, shape, and then as they, act they get activated, uh, they send out these fibrils and such to help with the clotting process. But they also release uh, quite a bit of, of cytokines and growth factors and such. And these are the, these are the messages to the local area that kind of orchestrate and uh, recruit stem cells, mobilize stem cells, and initiate things like um, tissue generation and repair, and of course, uh, new blood vessel formation as well, which we'll get into in a moment. So uh, just a brief interlude, you can take a look at some uh, really cool pictures of platelets that I've found. Um, that are, these are all activated platelets. Uh, most of these are real pictures. The ones on the bottom left are, uh, are computer generated. So back into our business here. Um, 
platelet growth factor functions uh, have been very well studied in the literature. And it's easy to, to see what uh, growth factors are within the platelets, such as a platelet-derived growth factor, obviously the name, TGF and VEGF, EGF, and uh, fibroblast growth factor and IGF. Uh, these are all um, with, locked away inside those, uh, those, those granules and platelets, and, and they have a very, very strong effect in the area where they are released. And uh, you can see the biologic functions from endothelium, fibroblast, mitogenesis, to collagen synthesis, to uh, proliferation of other cells, and, and angiogenesis, and vessel permeability, and so forth. So these are very, very powerful molecules that we are trying to harness uh, for the betterment of our patients. Um, so how do we do that? Of course, there's a spin that's involved, and most of us uh, are uh, looking at uh, trying to get a very high concentration of platelets. We want to try to get more than a million platelets per microliter in our platelet count, and uh, we'll go into some of that information in a little bit. Uh, we have here a picture of the whole blood. That's what regular blood looks like. And when you spin it down, obviously, you're going to see a lot more platelets there um, in, the, in the platelet concentrate. So as I mentioned, the platelets are storehouses for regulatory signaling and uh, growth factor molecules that enhance hair growth. Uh, so this can be used as a standalone therapy. I'm going to get into the reasons why this is the fact, why we think this is working. Uh, this is a really, really cool um, diagram that that gives us a little bit of insight as to exactly what's happening with these growth factors that are, exist in the PRP and how they might affect a hair follicle and, and the, and the uh, follicular genesis, if you will, or the cycling of the hair follicles. How would they impact it? So when the growth factors bind to this tyrosine kinase receptor, for example, you get a cascade of events. And this cascade of events will increase proliferation and differentiation and survival of certain cells and decrease cell death in other cells. And so um, I've listed here on the right-hand side, so when you go back, you can uh, see what each of the different uh, growth factors and, and triggers are here, as well as the description, uh, which you know we can, we can reference later on. Um, platelet concentration and stem cell proliferation. There's a relationship, right? So we want to. It would make sense. We want to try to concentrate these platelets and concentrate the growth factors to get the most amount of uh, most amount of effect as possible, right? So someone did a study to find out, hey, what does this concentration do? to uh, stem cell migration and proliferation, and yes, absolutely, it was related to the concentrate above native levels of the, in, this, in the blood serum. And so as you increase, uh, you get more stem cell migration and more proliferation, and that would be one of the reasons why you get good, better wound healing, um, you know, decreased, uh, uh, you know, a decreased shedding and increased hair growth, perhaps, uh, as stem cells rush into the area, potentially. Um, but is more always going to be better? And so another study looked at the amount of vascular neogenesis in relation to the platelet concentrates that were applied. And what they found was a biphasic curve, meaning that as you reach a certain maximum uh, concentration, then uh, you get the maximum effect. But if you go over that, then you start to get a reduced effect. So they found that there was an optimal concentration of about 1.5 million platelets per microliter um, to get this vascular neogenesis going. So if you're not getting a four to six times concentrate in your PRP uh, in the injectable product, you're probably not reaching this threshold uh, and or the other one for stem cell migration. So uh, there's ways that we in the Bauman Medical, we test all of our PRP and the whole blood for every patient that we do, as well as actually the PPP, the platelet pore plasma that we pull off. So we know exactly what our, what our, um, what our, our PRP treatment is actually giving to the patient. So, Cool thing about PRP for hair loss is that it's the patient's own blood. Uh, it's obviously going to contain these growth factors that we've mentioned. You can do it right at the bedside. Patients walk in, walk out. It takes about an hour in our office because of some of the things that we do, give or take a little bit. Uh, so we call it a lunch hour by vampire treatment, if you will. Um, it's relatively comfortable. If you use local anesthetic, the patient should feel nothing. And it is relatively low risk. So what do we do in the office? How do we get this job done? Obviously, we want to select a good patient for this. And I mentioned a little bit before, we're going to look for someone who has some miniaturization, see what's going on in those areas of the scalp, get an idea of what their concerns are, um, uh, address the risks and other factors, uh, discuss other alternative therapies as well as PRP. We're going to take measurements and we're going to do some photography. We're going to look at the scalp, not only under the microscope, but also with standardized photos. We're going to do perform the phlebotomy uh, carefully so that we don't hemolyze the blood and go to spend. And uh, we're going to centrifuge and, and concentrate that blood with the, uh, we use the M-Site PRP kit um, to concentrate it. We find that that gives us that four to six time to concentrate. We'll do that testing I mentioned. We can additionally add 
uh, some enhancements, and we'll talk uh, briefly about this in a, in a future slide, that uh, sometimes we will add placental uh, tissue to the, um, to the PRP before injection. In the past, we used A-cell. Some patients do request that as well. You could uh, light up the PRP with, an, with a, uh, a, a multi-wavelength light to try to stimulate more cytokine production. So there's a number of different things that you can do uh, to enhance the effects of PRP, in my opinion. We will always do an antiseptic and anesthetic block of the patient's scalp. And I think this is important to be able to get the PRP in the right place in the scalp. So then we'll proceed with a very uh, superficial intradermal injection of the PRP, uh, do the microtrauma and microneedling after. Uh, some physicians that I've talked to like to perform the microneedling before. My preference is to do it after. Um, and then the patient will be given some post-treatment instructions and their follow-up appointments. If you're interested in the entire detail part of the protocol, um, then I encourage you to go to this link, uh, which is hai.rs slash PRP hair training, and uh, register there, and you'll get some more information about this particular, our particular protocol, and uh, even some opportunities hands-on to actually watch it being done if you like. So as I mentioned before, we always, in our practice, measure what's in our PRP because we want to know what is that concentration factor, how much PRP uh, concentrate are we getting over that whole blood, and what is our uh, total concentration of platelets uh, or per microliter, actually. And so this is just an, this is the machine I actually have in my office. I took this picture this week to add it to the slideshow. And this was a, a, a patient that we did last week, just randomly took one of the first ones I saw in the book. And you can see her whole blood initially was just under 200, and her, and her platelet concentrate, once we were done with the processing, was about 1,200. 1200. So what that means is that we had about 1.2 million platelets per microliter in about seven cc's of our injectable. Um, and we do this kind of log uh, and testing with the hematology analysis machine, like I said, for every patient. And this becomes part of the patient record. So we have a pretty extensive record of all the PRPs that we've done um, thus far this year with the, with the counter uh, and all of the platelet concentrates. So we'll be able to correlate, hopefully, with the hair growth that we're measuring with, like, for example, the hair check. Uh, which brings me to this slide. The hair check is an amazing tool. If you haven't gotten one, you need one. Uh, if you haven't learned how to use it or you've forgotten how to use it, you've got to come to the training to learn how to do this. This is a five-minute thing that basically tells you and the patient how well your treatments are working. And whether you're telling them to stand on their head doing a yoga pose at night or prescribing them a topical medication or performing PRP, patients are going to want to know how well it's working and where and how much. And the hair check tells you that in about a New York minute. And so this is an example of some of the, the hair mass index tracking that we do over here on the... Uh, on the left-hand side, and you can see our baseline numbers here for this patient, and as the hair mass increase over time uh, with treatment. Uh, you can see there's a peak and a plateau, and then it starts to diminish. And of course, uh, over time, uh, this is a common type of uh, evaluation and measurements that we do to really track exactly what's going on. Remember that hair growth is only about a, a half an inch a month, so it's going to take you about 90 days to start to measure this, and it's going to take you six months to see a change in the mirror for just about every patient, and maybe even a year to see a full improvement. So measurements are going to be performed at routine intervals to determine when your next PRP treatment is done. And uh, it's very important to tell the patient, obviously, that this is not a permanent result, but that they're going to get some kind of uh, plateau, peak and plateau, and then a diminishment of the, uh, of the process, um, of the result of the process over time. And so they need to be ready for, for measurements and determine when their next PRP will be. The way that we're doing our PRP uh, with the uh, additional enhancements like a BioD, which is the placental extract, we're getting about a year's worth of improvement from each patient, which is kind of nice. Instead of having to bring them back in every other month for treatment, uh, doing a standard PRP, we seem to be getting a little bit more, more oomph out of the, the PRP with the, uh, with the addition of the, of the amniotic and placental-derived extracellular matrix. So that's a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture to discuss the benefits of A-cell, uh, which is a tissue regenerating technology made from pork bladder. Um, the Addy light is something else that we also like, and uh, of course, low-level laser therapy before and after the, their procedures, I think they're very, very important. Uh, and so there's a reference here that you can take a look at. Again, if you want more information about these enhancements, I encourage you to seek out additional education on this topic. So some of the histological PRP effects that, that are seen within the scalp, this is all within the literature now, um, you can see epidermal proliferation. These are uh, done on biopsies. Stimulating the growth of follicular bulge stem cells. Uh, and folliculogenesis. We see in increased angiogenesis, more blood vessels obviously seen, uh, not only histologically and otherwise. Uh, we see increased numbers of hair follicles, so 
if a follicle was there but didn't wasn't producing a hair, then uh, there's a good chance that PRP is going to kick it into action, you know, start that antigen phase, increase collagen, increase fibroblasts, and so forth. And probably most importantly, increasing the thickness of the of the hair shaft that's coming out of the scalp. Um, I have to give a shout out to Dr. Buhana because uh, he influenced me a lot. I was in, probably in 2010. I watched his lecture on PRP in Paris at a, at a Masters in Hair Transplantation conference, and the really the light bulb went on for me because he showed the increase in the hair density and also how long this uh, this effect was going to last on his patients. He showed some nice before and afters. So, shout out to Dr. Buhana out there. Some of our results with PRP. Um, Patients always come in and they say, you know, I don't see a lot of results on the internet. Um, and really this is because you don't, you don't see a whole lot of results on Rogaine on the internet either. And the, the issue is, is that because once a hair follicle is dead and gone or you've lost enough hair to, to, um, to see the scalp shining through, think about that quantity of hair follicles that are already dead and gone. It's, it's, it's astounding. So really the patients that you're going to see with good results visually in the mirror from PRP are the ones who have just started to lose a bit of coverage. So this guy has been cherry picked for this slide presentation because you can see that he's a pretty young guy but he's just on the verge of losing some coverage. So his result from PRP measurably may not be that much different than everybody else. Let's just say a, a 10 to 20 percent improvement in the area um, but it was enough to give him a huge increase in coverage because he had a huge number of hair follicles that could be regenerated. And uh, here you see the before and afters in nine months. And he was a real happy camper with the treatments that we provided. I mean, it basically saved him from doing any other therapies at the moment. So he's, he's pretty happy about that. Um, women can sometimes have a very devastating condition. This is uh, um, a patient who had a severe amount of hair loss before we treated her. She had a nice improvement, not necessarily in that frontal zone where the devastation had really already occurred, that follicular homicide, if you will, but actually around the frame where she had a little bit more hair density, that's where she got a big improvement in bulk. And so um, she was sensitive about pictures of her scalp and she will put on that second picture. But if you look down in the temple areas, that's where her improvement in hair quality and, uh, and quantity really occurred. And uh, I will make mention that we also use PRP for small areas of alopecia areata. We've had some pretty good success. It takes about 12 weeks to see the response in most of these patients. Um, another patient with uh, alopecia areata who had a uh, some change coming on at six weeks and then the resolution at 12 weeks, so kind of exciting. This is a more typical patient that we see. Great candidate for PRP, um, starting to get a widening part line, a lot of scalp shining through in the zone, the PRP for her in that area. It's not a complete cure of the situation for sure, but definitely it's a nice improvement at that nine month uh, timeline, which is really, really great. Um, we've had some interesting success uh, getting the word out on the street about PRP. For hair regrowth, uh, there's been a number of news stories, not only in the local and the national media, about PRP. Um, a lot of people here in South Florida have had PRP already done on their knees or joints or otherwise, so they're very much you know, in tune with how good PRP works in other areas of the body. So it's just kind of a natural thing. I will make a mention also of how we use PRP in her transplantation. This is part of our history. Um, as I mentioned before, Dr. Weevil, Dr. Cooley, and some others in the field we're using it as a, not only as a graft storage media, but also as a wound healing accelerator during hair transplantation. And uh, again, it was Dr. Buhana kind of convinced me that, hey, this could really work as a standalone treatment. So just to conclude out uh, tonight, hair loss is certainly a concerning problem for many. Uh, PRP offers a promising treatment option as a uh, non-chemical, you know, minimally or non-invasive treatment. Risk is low and side effects are very rare. Um, and we could go over uh, some of the side effects in uh, future educational opportunities. Uh, it's, I think it's important to take home message to realize that not all PRP is created equal. That certain differences in platelet concentrates and, uh, uh, and other factors are going to be very, very important. And maybe Dr. Roy can give her input on this as well as we finish off here. Um, but the preparation, dosage, and the administration and such can very, very great, very greatly, even amongst uh, different preparation styles within your own office with the same equipment. So um, a couple of years ago, the research on PRP hair regrowth was almost non-existent, but, but now the evidence is increasing. So I keep a close eye on the literature. You're going to see more and more coming out because these protocols are working and they're constantly being proved by people out there. <laughs> so if you'd like to learn a little bit more about PRP, 
uh, for hair regrowth, we do offer hands-on training programs at Bauman Medical Group. It's, uh, it's an exciting and, and fun uh, uh, educational opportunity to take part in. We also teach the medical management of hair loss at the same time, in addition to the, uh, the, uh, the hair check measurements, of course, which are the compliance protocols. And uh, we have a pretty interesting program for those who are trying to add PRP to their practice or enhance the PRP that they're already doing in their practice for hair loss. And uh, to learn a little bit more about that, I would just say go to the, 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 the bit.ly link that you see there, uh, hai.rs slash PRP hair training. And uh, register there if you'd like to get a little bit more information about some of the things that we have to offer you. And we uh, would love to share those things with you. So my motto is what's good for your patients is good for your practice. Uh, if you're already doing a PRP, keep doing it. It's, you're only probably going to get better at it. So uh, you know, keep at it. References are listed here in the presentation, so uh, if anybody would like a hard copy of that, also go and register at that link. And uh, we are also uh, if in the hand in the handout section of the GoToWebinar. You will see there's also a, a printable uh, registration form uh, in the handout section. We've got uh, the uh, the Bauman Medical Training there listed there, uh, as well as some other information uh, as you need. So I really do thank you for your attention tonight. I hope you found it interesting and uh, maybe uh, picked up a pearl or two as we went through. I know we went through quite a good pace, but uh, the idea is to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing and how we're doing it and uh, how excited we are about uh, what's happening in the field of uh, hair restoration. We hope we can help you take it further. Dr. Bauman, thank so you that, very Dr. much. Roy, you... Here I am. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really welcome. appreciate it. I do have a couple of questions, and, and there were a couple of questions that came through. First. I was very impressed, actually, by the, um, uh, the CBC with differential that you do on all your patients. I, I, I wish we could all do that. I think that data collection is going to be very valuable in the future. For my procedures, um, I, I definitely need a robust platelet concentration, but I'm also very focused on the monocyte and granulocyte levels where the granulocytes are pro-inflammatory and the monocytes are anti-inflammatory. And looking at your strip there um, uh, that, that showed the differential, there was very high monocyte count and very low granulocyte count. So, so when I use Play the Rich Plasma and, and some of the urologists that I've spoken with who use Play the Rich Plasma, that, that's a very important piece for us. How do you feel about that and, and its importance? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I would 100% agree with you. I did kind of you know slide through that pretty quick uh, on that slide, but yes, getting rid of the granulocytes that are definitely inflammatory as well as the erythrocytes, of course. Some of our earlier kits and spinners were giving us platelet-rich plasma that I would consider tainted, uh, literally you know bloody uh, with erythrocytes, and uh, we, it created a lot of inflammation on the scalp, and even discomfort, and, and and in some cases bruising and. And for, for scalp treatment, uh, we definitely want to avoid that. As, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, there is an inflammatory, if there is an inflammatory process uh, that's visible to the naked eye, obviously we want to take care of that. Um, but we do know that even male and female pattern hair loss has an inflammatory component to it. Uh, I did some research a couple of years back with, with collaborating with the University of Miami and, and uh, inflammasome uh, research on the caspase uh, uh, release dates and such, and uh, and we know that there are certainly uh, inflammatory um, inflammatory markers that are happening even with male and female pattern hair loss. And mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why we put anti-inflammatories in many of our topicals. And I think that you're absolutely right. You know, getting that monocyte count up and the granulocytes down is also an added benefit to the hair loss process. Meaning you're going to get better hair regrowth if we can get that that, that inflammation modulated down. Yeah, well, that's so, good. Yeah, to good know point. That. And a lot of the and a lot of the you know, a lot of the single spin processes really don't help you do that. We well, you know, in what's fact, your, what's been your experience in that? It's it's my understanding that M site really is the only system that's out there that does effectively give you a high monocyte count and a low granulocyte. Actually, that that's not true. I'm sorry, I'm going to correct myself. Um, one of the Arthrex systems does affect that ratio favorably. It's not quite as robust as M-Site, but just to be fair, um, there are very few systems out there that do. And we're all focused on platelet count, which I think we absolutely need to be true to the science. Um, but I just want to raise that with monocyte and granulocyte because it, it often just gets skipped over. And I think it might 
actually be more important than, than we realize. Um, we are going to have Dr. Peter Everts on one of our webinars coming up soon. He is, is the most published scientist on pl the rich plasma, and we'll have him share all of, of these little details with us so that we can get the best outcome. I think it are, I think it is those details that are going to prove better outcomes, you know, as we learn more and more. So thank you very much. One of the questions that came in earlier was about a favorite microneedling device, if there is a favorite microneedling device for you, um, and also asking the question about the Endymed Intensive device. Well, I actually have that device, and it's a radio frequency microneedling device. I wouldn't use that on the hair right now. I would worry about the potential inflammation that occurs as a result of the radio frequency, which is excellent for collagen stimulation, but I'm not so sure about uh, hair follicle. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Bauman? It, well, I, I wouldn't use it on the scalp, uh, the Endymed, um, but in terms of my favorite microneedling tool, you know, there's uh, a lot of discussion out there about what microneedling tool is going to be uh, FDA approved or not, and so mm. forth. And you know, we all know that you know these devices are you know I would say just at the moment in limbo. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's. Uh, I, I mean, I, I will tell you my preferences uh, in terms of microneedling. Uh, I do it very lightly. Yeah. You know, I can. You know, I don't try to make hamburger out of the uh, <laughs> out of the scalp. There, we're not doing a, a resurfacing job. You know, we just want to activate the platelets and let them know, hey, there's a little something going on here. So I'm looking for a little bit of punctate bleeding, a little bit of erythema. Um, I find that the, the powered tools, not battery, but the, the actually the AC powered tools um, work a little bit better in the scalp. They don't seem to catch on the uh, on the hair. Um, as a, and certainly, you know, uh, definitely want to try to avoid any rollers, which uh, which right. get tangled in the hair, and that can be a big mess. Right. So, uh, now, there's a billion of those devices that are out there. But hopefully, we'll have some interesting news for you within the next six months or so about some companies that are working on, uh, you know, the the approvals and the clearances that they need to really be able to take these these tools to market appropriately. Yeah, that's a very good point. And for any of you who aren't aware, the FDA is not happy about many of the medical devices that are being offered that many of us have actually in our office. And I don't necessarily think it's a problem with the device itself. It's, it's more going through the approval and making sure that these needles are sterilized and, and things are, are done properly. Um, PRP Science does offer the Dermapen 3. Uh, that is what I use. I, I agree. I like a cord, um, a pen with the cord versus the battery. I think you get just a much better consistent delivery. And uh, I think that's probably enough we need to say about that. The other question yes. says, I just started doing PRP hair growth treatments where I, uh, I mix vitamin D, B complex, A cell together, and I inject it under the scalp over that. I also inject activated PRP. After that, I do microneedling with leftover activated PRP. You know, this is this is really getting into some of the protocol stuff, which I think is it should be left for the training because there's so much to this and so much knowledge that that we really should have about hair in general before we go off and just start offering these treatments. I'm not a proponent of offering platelet-rich plasma as a solution as a solo treatment um, without any further knowledge about medical options and maybe doing blood work, looking at hormones. So I'm actually not going to finish that question if I, I hope you don't mind, Dr. Bauman, uh, but I really- Yeah, no, that, that's fine and I, I agree with you. And uh, you know, you've been through the class uh, a, yep. little, a little while back, things have changed a little bit, but uh, you know, so you could probably speak to how you know, important it is to, to go through that kind of a specialized uh, training program. It really is. In our last webinar, we did an hour of, of that point exactly and what training programs are available. And I, I just briefly mentioned yours. Um, I will say that it is excellent. I, I went through it. I learned a lot. I actually feel as though I need to go through it again because I, I think there's a lot more um, that I, I need to pick up and incorporate into the practice. I always check different nutrient hormone levels. I do quite a bit of medical management, and that's all thanks to the knowledge that uh, that I picked up, or the information, rather, that I picked up at your training. It's um, it's excellent. I love the hair check. I don't do enough of them. I, I'm, I'm uh, 
really rather embarrassed to say that, but I think that that ob whenever you can get an objective measurement uh, because, of success. You know, I'll tell you that, um, you know, there's, I mean, if you just over-the-counter minoxidil, uh, it's, minoxidil and Rogaine has been rated as uh, the worst hair growth treatment ever by Consumer Reports, most mm -hmm. disappointing. And uh, probably the reason is because most people give up too soon. They don't see the results of the treatment because they only have, maybe they only bought two bottles worth. They used it for two months. And right. for even to get a minimal amount of visual improvement, you have to really have a, a close-up uh, magnifying mirror in your bathroom yeah. and be looking at three months, not two months. So the hair check eliminates all of that. You don't want a patient coming back in saying, hey, you know, didn't, I don't know if this really worked. And uh, we don't need that kind of word on the street, not about PRP. We want, PRP works great. So does the other, so do the other therapies. And in order to, to have patients understand it, uh, they need to know it takes time for the hairs to grow, and you're going to measure it before you are going to see it. And so that's where the hair check comes in. It's critical. Yeah, I think that's important. And patient selection easy. is the key. Right. Right. And patient selection is the key. Setting the right expectation is the key. Helping patients understand that, you know, platelet-rich plasma is a tool. It's not a magic wand for anything that we do, although sometimes it, it does feel like that. You get a, uh, an outlier who just has an amazing, robust response no matter what you're doing. Um, but really, it's, it's a tool, and it's a great tool. And when we use it in conjunction with um, science and medical management and setting the right expectations, it's, it's excellent. Also, one of the reasons why I need to get back to your training and bring one of my staff members with me to, to learn how to do hair checks is because it's good for business. That's the other thing. If if you get somebody to who walks into your office and and who is willing to to pay for a procedure, it, it costs a lot of money to get that patient through the door. As we all know, we're we're business people as well as physicians. It's it's very very important that you serve them well and that you continue to have them come back to you for for the things that they need. So that hair check is a great tool to get them back in three months. They're excited to see what the results are. They're, they're willing to continue care, but you know, we all get busy and before you know it, three months is six months and you're right. They just, you know, this, this isn't working. They don't have the objective measure and they don't have that coaching that I think is so valuable to their, to the outcome and as well as to our business. So we can't forget that. No, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and and like I said in the presentation, you know, what's good for the patients is good for us. Uh, Absolutely. And so and, and it goes around that way. You know, if you can provide good value to your patients, then uh, they're going to be happy and happier, and they're going to spread the word more about mm -hmm. your clinic and what you're doing. So, um, you know, the, the training uh, that we do offer does include a lot of these uh, compliance protocols, right? As well, you know, the science-based and proven protocols, uh, as well as a lot of the some of the back-end stuff that you know. Most of us as busy professionals don't have time to work on, you know, like an e-store and, and a web presence uh -huh. and, a, and, a, and a, you know, a, a patient inquiry generator and things like that. It's, it really saves all of that uh, effort and energy uh, if, if, if you choose to employ that part of, uh, of our programs. Uh, in your own practice. It's kind of like we've done all the hard work for you already. Yeah. So, no, I, I think that's that's we'll a really good we'll point. we try to make it easy for you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. the challenge that we all have is implementation. Work, really. mm -hmm. Yeah, and Jill's done a great job with PRP sure. Science with providing marketing materials and, and just sort of jump start. You know, when you come to my trainings, you, you get some very, very helpful forms, uh, patient forms and questionnaires and, and just all those nitty gritty things. I know hair check is excellent in, in that regard and, and your team and, and uh, my team continue to try to yeah, make well, that shout out to Andres, you know, you have your, you have your Jill and, uh, <laughs> and I have my Andres. So yep. yeah, I'm uh, Andres Gonzalez. I'm sure uh, uh, would, would appreciate that, uh, that, you know, that shout out that, um, you know, he's, he's really the, the man behind the method when it comes to executing the, uh, the hair coach program and, and the training that we do offer in that regard. And uh, he really he has taken it to another level since its inception. So uh, yeah. uh, all of that hard work, you know, ha as an MBA, he's put that together and, uh, and done that hard work for you. Well, I love this kind of collaboration, both clinically as well as from a, from a business and implementation perspective. I think we all win together when we when we concentrate on taking the best care of patients and when we pool our resources, so to speak, and, and, and uh, share the knowledge, and, and whether it's marketing ideas or uh, all of the clinical information that you've given us tonight. So I, I really thank you very, very much.
And please check out the handouts. We'll be sending an email out with, with a recording of the seminar or the video, the webinar rather, I'm sorry. So please feel free to, to look again and it'll be posted on join.studioprp.com. So thank you very much for joining right, us. Thanks, uh, Dr. Bauman. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Roy. I really do appreciate the invitation tonight. And uh, speaking of sharing, if you're out there on social media, you know, yes. connect with us. Uh, if you'd like to give us some feedback about the uh, program or or that you'd like to hear about in future events, uh, either on Dr. Roy's side or, or from Bauman Medical, you know, just let us know. We're out there, you know, whether it be LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, I also got Instagram and uh, everything else that's YouTube <laughs> out the wazoo. So, uh, you know, uh, give us a shout out out there and, uh, and we'll take a look at your stuff as well. And so I think it's important to, for all of us who are in the field of PRP and, and, and taking care of patients to move things forward in the, in the public eye as well. So we're happy to, to help you do that. Excellent. We'll keep doing this every month, bringing some good information to you. And if you have any suggestions as to what it is that you'd like to hear in some of these webinars, please let us know and, and we'll try to do our best to make that happen for you. All right. Good night then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Roy.